All right, ladies and gentlemen, I have Roger Jones on. He is a uh, former client. I actually sold a house for him in the last month or two and uh, turned friend. I've learned a lot from Roger talking about uh, redfish, speckled trout, flounder. We've uh, had a lot of conversations, so I thought it was very fitting to have you on. Roger, thank you so much for coming on, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> I really don't feel uh, worthy, but oh. <laughs> uh, I'm su- super happy to talk with you. Yeah, man, you you definitely are. I uh, actually saw your post today. You were actually on some redfish today, so that's very fitting that our conversation be about targeting redfish. How uh, how'd you end up doing today? I ended up with three, uh, which was uh, which was really good actually because I uh, I worked really hard yesterday and didn't catch anything. <laughs> So uh, Monday was a pretty good day. Caught some solid trout. Tuesday was not, uh, but today was uh, was a whole lot better. Had to just completely change locations and find some bait. That uh, that leads me to like my first question when I when I think about redfish in general is what are what kind of areas are you looking for to try to find these fish? Is it more like a bay system? Is it more creeks? Is it more like a estuaries off of the intracoastal what what's your opinion on that it's a little bit time of the year dependent but uh my my love is the skinny water i like to be 24 inches or less uh and so i'm i'm in a lot of bays a lot of marsh systems and things like that extremely tough time of the year for me to fish is in the spring this this transition from from cold to warmer and then it goes back and forth Uh, i can be on a bite and then come back in two days it's completely shut down so it's uh, this is definitely the toughest time of the year for me and when you're targeting uh these bays uh what are you specifically looking for in the bay uh first i would assume is the right water depth what do you prefer i just anything that uh i I like to see the water in in the bay just kind of lapping up to the bottom of where the marsh grass is coming out of the mud, uh, especially if it's if it's falling. Or a lot of the bays that I uh, I fish aren't really tidal dependent. It's more wind pushing it around, especially you know more up north. So um, you know bait is key. If it, that's one of the problems we had yesterday, that's we couldn't find any bait. But uh, when you can find the bait uh, before too long, that those spring shrimp are going to start hatching out and they're going to be jumping around. I usually find those with my trolling motor, ah. believe it or not. <laughs> uh, I guess the, the harmonics of the electric motor kind of drives them a little bit crazy, and then you'll see them start jumping and scattering, mostly behind the boat, actually, not so much in front of it. But once you find those, um, glass minnows this time of the year, and the mud minnows start showing up. But uh, starting to see a few of them, but uh, not where it needs to be. In another, another 30 days, it'll be my type of time. And you were saying earlier that you like the water level to be slightly below the grass. Is that because it actually flushes all that bait into the bays? Yeah, without a doubt. When when the water's down below the grass, every all the uh, the, sh- the the shrimp and the minnows and the little crabs and all the things the redfish love to eat are all washed out with it for the most part. Um, maybe not the crabs all together, but it's for sure all the bait fish and all the shrimp. Um, my um, my father and I. When, when I was a teenager, he had a uh, little shrimp boat, a little 25-foot boat. So I learned a whole lot about uh, what shrimp do and, and how they act. And, you know, after a lot of rain, you know, as the tide's falling and so forth. And I've actually incorporated a little bit of that into my, my red fishing techniques. So that's why I like to see that water coming out of that grass. And then, you know, uh, when you're dealing with uh, shallow water, and even if the, um, the redfish uh, are in – you know, some of the murkier stuff that we have up north around the Thompson area, they give themselves away pretty readily when they're hungry because you'll see those swirls. Uh, they like to, at least the estuaries that I fish, they like to run points. It'd be like a scallop bay. They'll run to a point, swirl around, then they'll run over to another point, swirl around, and then come back. And a lot of times if you just ease in and just stand on the bow of the boat, just watch. Uh, it's kind of hard to do sometimes cause I get a little bit excited when I get out there and it's like a little kid, mm-hmm. but, um, just, just watching and finding the movement, finding, finding the wildlife, finding, you know, finding that bait is, is, is where it's at. In in your experience is, uh, say you're in a, a bay that you've been thinking about fishing this morning, you get there, there's no bait. 
are you automatically like, all right, it's time to start thinking about spot number two, or do you still give it a chance? I'll give it a few casts, uh, it, especially if there's some if it's a bay I've fished before and had some luck. I'll definitely hit some of those uh, more premium target areas in it before I move on. But usually, if you don't see anything, there usually, in my circumstance, there usually isn't anything there. I'll, you know, I catch some fish blind casting every once in a while, but for the most part, we see them. When you were talking about the the point, the how they roll from point to point uh, on these specific points, is it going to be a mud uh, covered bottom, or is it going to be more oysters, or what are you seeing? It, it's usually that uh, pluff mud, that that dark mud, um, and oyster. You know, there, there might be some oyster in on the edge, but most of these grassy areas, instead of it going gradually up to to the surface, as far as the the mud, it it more falls off right at the edge of the uh, the grass. So you've got that little ledge, and they'll run those ledges. It, it's been my experience. Okay, and uh, you're in a bay system you've pulled up or you've used your trolling motor to get in on these points. Are you seeing fish on your way in or is it more so you see the fish when you get to the edges of these, these usually, creeks? Yeah. I usually see the bait first. Okay. Uh, and especially, you know, if the redfish are, are, are running the grass lines that sometimes you'll even see bait shower out and, you know, land up in the grass trying to get away from them. But when, when they're in a couple of feet of water and it's, say it's a 20 foot, I'm 20 foot, 20 inch red, mm-hmm. when he swirls hard and turns around and cuts back the other direction, it's, it's a whole different uh, effect on the water than a mullet jumping or minnows coming by or something like that. After you've seen it a few times, you can spot it from a, from a long way out. Okay. Uh, what, uh, I guess it depends on the time of day, but what type of bait is your go-to? Like what would be the structure from let's say sunrise to 9 a.m. I'm probably not the best person to give you advice on bait <laughs> because I fish top water way longer than I should. You, you'll see me out there on a bluebird's day at 12 o'clock still chunking it if I think there's a chance uh, <laughs> because I, I just love that top water bite. First thing in the morning, I'm going to throw probably be throwing top water. Uh, as the sun starts to get up a little bit, if I'm still fishing real shallow water, I'll throw wake baits. Um, I've I've taken to the last two or three years doing a little wake bait modifications where I'll put, uh, you know, most of the ones that you, you buy, no matter how hard you crank them, you're only going to get them a couple of inches below the water. But if you put a much heavier treble on the first treble, it lowers the front end a little bit and you can get them to run about six or seven inches slowly, not, you know, just ripping, but they'll still get the action because the back of the lure doesn't have that weight on it. You only put the heavy hook on the front. So I'll throw those a lot um, simply because I like hard baits, and I throw um, X-wraps a lot uh, in the summertime. What's your well. go-to top water? Um, oh, number eight, skitter walk. Okay. Uh, and then the, uh, which is a smaller one, and then the next size larger, which I think it's an 11 or something like that. I'll start throwing that in August, September when the mullet are at, their peak size for the year because everything right now is pretty small at least everything that i'm seeing is and then uh and if it's you know early in the morning say it's slick calm i like to throw a smaller top water instead of throwing something big and obtruse but uh if, if i get there and the wind's blowing and there's ripples on the water i'll throw something bigger so you're primarily trying to match that hatch when you're in these bays I'm trying to get noticed yeah okay I'm trying to get noticed so if Try not to be too noticeable in slick, calm conditions, and then trying to make more racket when when it's uh, when <laughs> yeah. the wind's blowing and it's all ripply out there. Yeah, that does make a lot of sense. Uh, so, say you you've reached it's a, it's eleven a.m. Top water shut down. What would be your go to as far as the next option for what you'd like to target these fish with? Probably uh, paddle tails, um, depending on what type of water I'm in. I fish a lot from. I live in Washington Acres. Um, it's right between Topsail and Wrightsville Beach, but I mostly fish north. So I'm getting in, as soon as I leave my dock, the water's getting darker and darker and darker. So when I'm fishing down that way, I'll choose darker colors uh, for the most part. Uh, today, uh, Z-Man uh, Gold Rush, it's black with big gold flake in the belly. That worked pretty good today. That's the skitter walk colors that I was thinking that I would use is the the black back with like the gold underbody Mm -hmm. 
what what do you prefer as far as skitter walk goes skitter walk uh, most of mine have chartreuse belly uh, it, it's, it's sort of a the the people that fish with me a lot of time i fish that frog pattern and they know that I'm going to be throwing that frog. <laughs> and, you know, the frog pattern's up on top of the water. The fish don't see that, but the belly of it's chartreuse. And then uh, I like pink a lot. Throw a lot of pink. Uh, throw a lot of chartreuse. And um, orange. So just, you know, kind of loud colors. Okay. You mentioned earlier that uh, the trolling motor will actually spook up the shrimp. I've never heard that, and I just got my trolling motor, which you helped me get, so thank you for that. But uh, I haven't spent enough time doing it to know that. Um, when you're using your trolling motor, are you, uh, how are you approaching these areas that you think the fish would be in? From a long ways off. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think that when you're dealing with these big bays, and, and at their deepest, they're three feet. And then as you get closer to the edge, they, you know, they taper right on off to about a foot and then they'll hit that grass ledge and come up. But, uh, I think the, what I've learned with the trolling motor is, is come in, don't come in hot, put it on whatever speed one, two or three that you're going to troll that bank with, or you're going to fish that bank with and keep it on there. And sometimes it feels like forever before you're going to get to where the, you see the, the bait jumping or the redfish swirling. Uh, but the other thing that I do, um, in addition to that with the trolling motor is all my top water rods are seven and a half foot and I can, I can throw those a mile. Mm -hmm. And so I just, my, uh, philosophy is just stay as far away from the fish as you can. I don't turn the trolling motor on and on and off or anything like that. I just try to make whatever noise that they're hearing, just be consistent because, you know, a lot of things that I hear noises. I may not even know that the noise is there until it stops, right? I'm thinking about uh, when you're driving down the road and you see a deer on the side of the road. A lot of times if you just keep your same speed, they won't even look up. Mm -hmm. But the minute you slam on brakes, you alert them and you spook them. And then they're so, jumping around. Yeah, it may, and they'll run out in front of you. Makes sense. That makes a lot of sense now that you bring that up. Um, what, what type of uh, line are you running if you're trying to get as much cast distance as you can? I usually use a 15-pound Power Pro on, on everything. And, uh, I just, uh, I just had all my rods, uh, re, um, new braid put on all of them, uh, for the year. And uh, I hate new braid. <laughs> yeah, Wind knots. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I don't change braid because it's two years old or whatever. I, I change braid when it's, when I've broken off so many times that there's not enough line on the reel because mm -hmm. this stuff I've had braid that I've had on for six years, five years. And uh, just when it gets too short, I put more on. Yeah. I know uh, I've I'm become friends with Tex at Texas Tack on what they'll do is uh, they'll actually backfill it with monofilament mm -hmm. sometimes instead of replacing all the braid. But I would be the same way. I'm kind of OCD about that stuff, so I'll, I'll replace it all too. Fish it to the spool. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, so we've talked about uh, the types of rods you like. What size reels are you using for these redfish? Uh, Three thousand. So I use. Um I'm a hundred dollar reel guy. I've got a, I've got a couple of, uh, of nice reels, but most of my stuff's just Shimano Nasi's. I think you're a Nasi fan too. I'm a, a massive fan. Yeah. I've got two Stratix and a couple of CI fours, but most of what I've got is Nasi. Okay. They, they work great. Yeah. In, in your opinion for the hundred bucks, you can't beat it. Yeah. They just last and last. I didn't have high expectations when I bought them. I, I, they were smooth out of the box, but everything's smooth out of the box. And, uh, we beat these things up pretty hard and, I've been super impressed. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen any of the new ones yet. I'm still using the old ones. I have both, and I love the new ones in comparison to the old ones. They, oh. They're a little stiffer, which I like. You know how the, the older ones, they'll flex a little bit on you? Yeah. The new ones don't do that. So I'll next time I see you, I'll have to bring it and let you at least put it in your hands. But I, I, I'm a big fan of that too. What um What type of boat are you fishing for these redfish? Oh, man, this is my uh, – <laughs> my retirement bucket list boat and, and uh, uh it's a hughes red fisher 18 and uh with a 115 show on it and uh it was just it's one of these boats that i've ripped you know everybody that would ever let me ride with them in one mm -hmm. <laughs> i even back when I, I know a guy that had a lappy and he didn't even know me i saw him at uh at the marina and he took me for a spin in it they just um they're not the shallowest boat um for sure but stable and they ride like a cadillac and coming from the last boat that i had which was a skit was a really lightweight skiff and it beat me to death this thing is just um 
you know, I, I don't mind if so much if I'm not catching fish because I'm just riding around having fun. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's half the half the battle is just getting out on the water. So yeah, yeah. You have to appreciate it when you do get out. Yeah, I love that thing. I it's the only uh, boat that I ever ordered and got it just the way I wanted it, and, and with a lot of help from from the from the folks that I uh, I bought it from uh, Palmetto and uh, okay. Charleston. Okay. And uh, I went in and inspected it all out with them, and uh, the guy came back and he changed about half of what I. I, I wanted and actually made the boat considerably cheaper uh, oh, because nice. he said, for what you want to do, you don't need all that stuff. So, uh, they were really good people. That's good. It's been a really good experience. In uh, in your experience, um, I'm, I'm jumping back to the reds, but you, you've got your trolling motor running, you, uh, you've eased into this bay system. How are you approaching the fish and casting at the fish? Are you like, what is your, what is your technique on that? I never go straight at them. I'll go off to the right or off to the left and try to try to catch them at like a 45 if I can, uh, because when I'm throwing at a 45, I can stay on that bank longer with my, my top water instead of throwing it to the bank and walking it straight back to me. If I come in at a 45, I can throw it to the bank and I can walk it off of the, the side of the bank and still stay closer to it, you know, kind of run parallel with it a little bit. That makes sense. Uh, in my experience too, uh, I try to, not cast directly at the fish try to get out in front of them because you'll you'll spook the whole school absolutely uh, as a matter of fact if there's places on this bank that i'm fishing that have you know mud or sand or whatever i'll throw on that mud and that sand and then i'll drag my lure into the water just so i don't even make a splash that's super stealthy <laughs> but you know there's been also been occasions where i've cast it into an area and the plug went in the water it went under the water and i thought i was hung on something and it was in a fish's mouth it's just like uh, you know he was yawning and i happened to throw it in his mouth but um so it, it's weird that the fish is just according to what sort of mood they're in because if you're if you're too aggressive and you're too splashy or you get too close to them sometimes you know it, it bothers them but i've seen them in areas of the marsh where the grass is like broken grass so there's room in between it i've seen them come through that and part that grass to get to that top water plug so it's wow. it's amazing it's just according to you know what type of mood they're in are you uh targeting these fish on a specific tide or do you adjust um, how you actually fish them based on that tide well if uh you know, if I'm, I'm running into a marsh system, I'm going to fish it in the tide super low. I'm naturally, I'm going to have to stay, you know, more directly in the, in the channels that get me there. But I like to go all the way to the back of them because typically if the redfish are in there on low tide, they seem to push to the deeper spots. And a lot of times those deeper spots are in the back, at least in the areas that I fish. As far as jig heads go, what's your opinion on the perfect jig head for, say, two feet, one foot? eight inches what are you what are you throwing when you throw a paddle tail i've started using uh, you know the the weighted worm hooks uh with the the weight kind of on the mm -hmm. keel of the hook i've been started using that a lot because uh, a lot of the places that i fish if i if i forward weight the the bait the soft plastic with the jig head itself it tends to want to dive more with this i can throw it out in that skinny water and i can you know, I figure out what my speed needs to be or what my cadence needs to be on my reel, and I can run that right right in the middle of the water column because that's where I'm shooting for. Even if it's if it's 18 inches, I'm still trying, you know, to get right in the middle. That's one of the reasons why I think I've been successful fishing top water so late in the day is because I'm only if, if I'm throwing in 12 inches of water, you know, the, the fish is, you know, if it's a decent size red, he's, he's five inches tall, uh, so the bait's still going to be right in his face. Do you uh, target areas other than these bays for redfish? Yeah, I, I get uh, if it's um, if it's a really warm bluebird sunny day, I, I'll go into deeper water and I'll start fishing docks and things like that. We, um, we always start out in the morning shallow, and then uh, Wade and I, the a guy I fish with a whole lot, good friend of mine, we call it dock knocking. It's time <laughs> to go dock knocking. So and, you know, and we throw. Um, I don't. We don't really use any any bait or anything like that, but it's mostly. Uh, throwing paddle tails or jerk shad. Uh, I think probably one of the most overlooked baits that I see um, is uh, just a, a white zoom fluke jerk shad. I mean, you can buy a whole bag of them for $4, and they, they catch fish like crazy, and they're great around docks. They skip good. And uh, I mostly use um, those eye strike uh, jig heads. Okay. I, I'm kind of at an advantage there. Um, I work a little bit. 
at the fishing uh, shack there at Eastern Outfitters in Hampstead. So they give me a, a discount. Uh, I, I basically work there when Luke, the manager, or somebody that works there needs a couple of days off or a day off every once in a while. So I only work about a day a month. But uh, and then when I go, you know, whatever I would have made for the day actually leaves in a bag with me. You yeah. know, so. <laughs> get paid in baits. Yeah. <laughs> and the inside scoop. You yeah. get to hear everything that's going on with yeah. the tackle talk. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, certainly do. So when you're fishing these docks, are you uh, trying to cast underneath the docks? What, what is your, what's your technique for that? I used to always uh, try to fish underneath them. Uh, but, a, but a guy that I know um, that fishes a lot of redfish tournaments and things – he, he told me that, you know, he doesn't really throw under the dock. I've had a lot of success uh, hanging fish under docks. Not a whole lot of success getting them out mm-hmm. for the most part. It's about a 50-50 shot. Uh, but he likes to throw a bigger paddle tail and throws it, you know, parallel to the dock. And just run it all the way, almost hitting the pilings as he's coming through, if you, you know, if he can. Because he, his theory is if the redfish is under the dock, he's going to have to turn around and face out to get your bait. And when he hits it, that's when you cross his eyes and get him out, you know, so, so he's not underneath the dock. That makes a lot of sense. But uh, I'll tell you, um, I didn't fish docks um, at all for, for a long time. And about, um, oh, I guess it was about 12 years ago. So even prior to that, I wasn't fishing docks. Mm-hmm. But I actually went to a seminar that Jot Owens teaches in the wintertime. Okay. And when I left that thing, he upped my game on dock fishing uh, and you know, it got to the point to where that's really all I wanted to do because he, it was a, it was a whole new thing for me. Mm-hmm. But, uh, if you ever get an opportunity to, uh, to go to one of his seminars, I think he, he does a couple every winter and, uh, the handouts and then all the, uh, all the notes. I probably got four pages of typed <laughs> notes after I, I'll share them with you. Okay. <laughs> I'll sell, I'll sell you to them. Yeah, there you go. Everything's <laughs> got a price, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But, uh, yeah. Um, you know, if, if it's, if it's a lower tide, I fish more the end of the docks. If it's a higher tide, you know, I'll go more towards where the docks intersect with, with um, you know, the either a bulkhead. Or uh, I really like a dock that, that comes back and it meets grass and oyster or something like some sort of harder structure. But the first thing I'm going to throw is down the side of a dock's topwater plug. Okay. Especially, I like to throw it all the way back in the corner. We, um Wade and I've got trade names for all this stuff. Oh, you yeah. know, hit the corner, hit the corner. <laughs> so the corner is where the dock intersects the land okay. or the bulkhead or whatever. Okay. So you throw it back, throw it in that corner, and just let it sit for a few minutes and not a few, a few seconds and uh, kind of get still and then slowly walk it right beside each one of those pilings. We've caught a lot of good redfish uh, really? doing that. I'm going to have to try that. I have it not done that. It works really well. Are you spot locking like just outside of your casting distance? Uh, yeah, usually. Okay. And you know if you can if you can uh, go up current on that dock and I put my power pole down usually because it's usually pretty shallow in there. Put the power pole down and then throw, and that as the the current is sweeping your lure toward the dock, just either speed it up or slow it down so it's just right beside it. That makes a lot of and sense. And then uh, and if, once you get set up like that throw it three or four times down that side because I've had, you know, on the fourth or the fifth cast is when they finally hit it. Because I think sometimes those fish hear it from a distance once or twice, and then they don't react on it. But once they hear it three, four times, then they come over and check it out. If you, So say you've thrown it top water at this dock a few times. Um, you grab another rod that has a paddle tail. Are you doing the same uh, technique with where you try to hit that corner and ease it down the pilings? or I might throw one that way, but I'm going to throw underneath that dock. Okay. Uh, just every, and then make sure that, you know, if that dock has a floating dock on it, make sure you, the ramp that goes down the floating dock, make sure you put three or four under that. I don't know what it is about those ramps, but I've put a lot of fish out from under those. And for goodness sakes, if it's an active dock and it's got a cleaning table on it, Oh yeah. <laughs> and, and if you see somebody there that uh has has got two or three boats and, and they look well used, that, that cleaning table's probably well used too. And I, we've pulled some nice fish out from under those. That's some great advice there. Yeah. That's using your context clues. Well we've we've actually got a few uh we've got a few docks that, that uh up north that uh, on some big bays that we fish and, and it's rare that you don't get a red fish out from under those cleaning tables. On oh, those wow. that's, that's awesome. I, I, I know that we uh, just thinking about the area that we live in. There's so much water 
it's like where do you begin you can fish from carolina beach all the way up to sneeds ferry that's you know 50 miles or 40 miles of water it's like where do we begin so are, are there any other like tools that you use to find these fish say you're trying to explore a new area i look for uh the same thing in a new area that i left in an old area that was productive say so it so there's some areas that, that I fish regularly and they're not being productive. Uh, I'll go to, I'll go and search out the, the places I caught fish today. I've never cast it in. They, they were, they were brand new uh, and, and they were right off the ICW. And the reason that I chose those is because I knew that they were closer to bait. The, the bait's just not back in those bays. I like to fish in yet. So um, take a spot. If, if you've got a spot that you 50% of the time you go to and you catch fish, go there on low tide and really look at that spot. Don't fish it. Just get in there, you know, nose the boat right in it and look and see what makes that spot that spot. It might seem special to those fish. And what I did was two or three of my really good spots in the beginning, uh, and I'm not really a sp- talking, you got to always fish a spot. But, yeah. but if you find a place that, that fish live and they like it, they like it for a reason. So, so, so really go in take a hard look at it, maybe even take some pictures of it on low tide and then go find other areas that have similar attributes to that. And that's how we went from having four or five spots to 105 spots. Yeah. The, that's the hardest part for me is like you, you, the only way that you're going to learn is by doing it. You got to get out there. You got to put in your time. But at the same time, it's like you, it's very frustrating if you're not catching but I'm a firm believer in there's no substitute for time out there because you do learn. I learn something every time I go, even now, and I've been chasing these reds for three years now. So it's, it seems like there's always something else to be learned. Yeah, it is. I, I'm at a, I'm at a big advantage now. Uh, I, you know, I did the 36 years in corporate America. So <laughs> and I just, um, I'm still pretty young and, uh, just got to retire. So, uh, tomorrow will be my fourth day of this week on the water. So, um, well, congratulations. That's what I'm, plan- that's what I'm planning on doing. <laughs> that's I'm a, trying, really trying to figure it out. You've put your time in, that's for sure. Yeah. Is there anything else that I have failed to ask you, Roger, about Reds that you can think of? Uh, no, not that I can think of. We don't, uh, you know, pretty much all artificial. We really don't do any bait fishing. Okay. Uh, but uh, I could catch a lot more fish that way, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, but just not not the way I'm wired, I guess. It's rewarding to, to trick a fish. Yeah, I guess you could call it that. Tra- and, and today, like you, you fished an area that you've never fished before, and just because of prior knowledge and, and how to break a spot down, you were successful. That's got to feel really good. It, it was. It, you know, it's, and it's a place that I've ridden by probably countless times and thought, you know, that looks fishy. That looks like there'd be some fish in there. But uh, just pick today because, and, and you know, when you really want, when I really reach out and, and go to some, some places I've never been before, it's usually after a day of getting skunked. Mm-hmm. And uh, then you just say, well, I know where they're not. Yeah, so yeah, we true. have to go someplace else. Yeah. Yeah. I, I advise everybody just to get out. You know, you, even if you have a 10 foot John boat, you can catch redfish with a 10 foot John boat. Heck yeah. I've caught, uh, is, I've caught way more on my kayak than I, than I have on that, uh, on that hue so far for sure. And you know, the, the funny thing about, uh, the redfish, it, it's all about, especially if you're in a kayak, I think I might have told you, you and I talked about this during the, you know, the time that we were trying to sell the house and so forth. But uh, when you're in a kayak and, and you paddle into an area, you're really a part of the environment. You, you, you're not scaring those fish. I've almost bumped redfish before in, in my kayak. I was in a, I was in a bay a couple of years ago. And then naturally, since I've gotten this boat, I don't kayak fish as much, but I still, <laughs> I still do it a little bit. Uh, I was in a bay and I, I've got a Hobie PA 14. It, it doesn't make any noise. You don't have to paddle it. It's got the, got the pedals and so forth. And I eased into an area and there was all sorts of, um, bait fish jumping. It's everything that you wanted. Things were showering on the bank. You were seeing swirls and all. And, and I pulled into, into the area and I was probably, um, you know, a hard casting distance off of the off of the grass line i casted two or three times i couldn't i couldn't catch any fish and, and um i just i couldn't believe that something wasn't happening so i was changing baits and then mean, meanwhile i was doing that i set my rod down and it kind of slipped out of my hand well it banged the, the kayak well everything from the kayak behind me just erupted it, i was in a school of redfish oh wow 
and you know, the water was dark. It was early. I couldn't tell, but, uh, there was maybe one or two redfish running the bank, but the other 25 were right there with me and I didn't even realize it. So it's, it's when, once you're, if you can figure out a way not to disturb them, you, you can catch them. It'd be a lot more successful mm-hmm. in my opinion. Anyway. Well, Roger, thank you so much for coming on, man. We're at 30 minutes. We've, we've talked for 30 minutes about reds and, uh, man, I can't wait to do it again. We'll, we'll have to talk about flounder next time. Well, maybe you can teach me something about flounder. <laughs> I'm yeah. <laughs> I'm looking forward for somebody to teach me how to catch uh, sheep's head. It's, too, well, so. it's funny because you you were talking about the white jerk shad. That's one of my favorite uh, flounder baits. Doing exactly what you're talking yeah. about for reds under docks, mm-hmm. you will catch flounder. And and you know if you and, and one more thing, if you're in, a, I, I'm a real big hard bait guy. I like the hard plastic baits. If you're in an area that's a little bit deeper, get yourself a. Uh, um, if you're in the lighter colored water or just that white ghost. Um, X wrap, I think it's a number eleven. It's the, the the larger one, or if you're in darker water like in, in the river, I've done real good with um, uh, redfish in the in the Cape Fear River. He's like, you know, it's I'm a little bit out of my element there because that water's deep. Yeah. So uh, I think X wrap the the one that I really like there that I've done well on is called Blue Steel. It's it's blue and orange and yellow and it's got uh, it's, it's dark but it's got a lot of bright colors on the bottom of it. Um, but uh, in a little bit deeper water, if you think there's reds there, they love those things. Trout okay. love them too, but but reds love those things. That's good, and and it's important to note that if you're targeting one fish, if you're in the right area, you may catch trout and flounder too. Absolutely. So it's all about following that bait, especially in the summertime. I, I caught two nice trout on Monday that were supposed to be redfish. Yeah, <laughs> that's the best. Uh, that's the best reward right <laughs> yeah. there. Is, oh wow, that's a surprise, but a pleasant yeah. one. But, it, it, you know, anything I can catch, I'll, I'll, I'll try to catch anything. Okay. Well, Roger, thank you again for coming on, man. It was awesome, and I can't wait to do it again. All right, sir. Thank right. you. Thank you.